So we're going to uh, move forward uh, with some more talks today about silage production. And our next one <clears throat> is Becky Arnold. Um, she's actually from Lollamond, and uh, she has a, a good perspective. She's been, you've been with Lollamond four years now? Four years now. Yeah, but you have uh, kind of uh, the knowledge all the way from the field all the way through to feed out. So she's going to talk today about um, some of the things that really can improve uh, the capture of feed value in terms of how you manage your silage. So we've talked uh, today about, you know, selecting when to harvest and talking a bit about fermentation analysis. And now she's going to tell you how you actually can, can capture that value and what things you should be paying attention to. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? All right, so there's some slides in the proceedings that are in the proceedings, but they're not in this presentation. And then if I have time, I had added some slides to the presentation that are not in the proceedings. So we'll see what we can get into. And for those of you that know me, you know that I am very passionate about silage. It's my favorite subject. It goes God, my dog, and then silage. Um, and those of you that don't know, you'll probably have it figured out by the end of my presentation. But I have a lot that I'm going to cram in. So I'm going to talk kind of fast. So you guys ready to strap in and let's go? All right, let's do it. All right, so um, key points that lead to quality silage. There's some points that I have identified that I think are our critical control points that are going to lead us down the path of achieving quality silage. And the first one is our goal, which is preserving the nutrients that we're harvesting out of the field to feed our livestock with, to make milk or muscle. The second one is going to be harvest timing and moisture. And I love the fact that we've got a lot of repetitiveness with the, the presentations that we've had so far, because some of these points will just get really driven home. So harvest timing and balancing your moisture versus dry matter is another one that is probably one of our most important factors that helps us achieve uh, quality uh, silage. The next one, we're going to talk about some fermentation fundamentals critical to ensiling, um, processing, and chop length. So whether you're processing your corn kernels or we talked about processing sorghum be uh, berries and all of that, those are things that need to be monitored throughout harvest. Um, and then we're going to talk about pack density. Pack density is probably my favorite thing. That, that topic just trips my trigger. So we're going to talk about that too because it's super important. Um, so the ones that I think are most important, we're going to talk about harvest moisture and pack density. So first, before we get into it, and John had kind of alluded to this a little bit, there's some terminology that I would like for us to get on the same page about. There's shrink, which is widely used in our industry, but I think it's a little bit deceptive. So shrink is measuring ton in, ton out. And that's how a lot of guys are gauging how things are going. Well, you can actually gain moisture in the pile, so you can actually gain weight in the pile from plant cell respiration. So if I like to talk in terms of dry matter loss or dry matter recovery, which is the actual nutrients that we're making a product out of. A ton of good feed weighs the same as a ton of bad feed, but they're not going to make a product the same. They might still make it into the TMR ration the same, but they're not going to produce the same results. So I'm going to talk in terms of dry matter and nutrient loss or recovery. Fair enough? OK, so there's four areas where we have nutrient losses that take place. The first one is going to be fermentation losses. So if we talk about having zero shrink, that's, that's impossible. We can't have zero dry matter losses. We've covered a little bit. John talked a little bit about the fermentation losses. I have on this slide here, we've got 2 to 6%. It's typical within our fermentation losses that takes place. We can have losses from leaching. That's usually that effluent runoff that runs out of the pile. That's usually not significant unless we really goof up. And I have certainly seen some environments where we have a significant amount of runoff. That's good stuff that's running out of the pile, you guys. That's sugar, that's protein, it's, it's, it's good nutrients that are just running straight out of the pile that we could have avoided if we would have waited a little bit and harvested at the right moisture. Surface loss, huge spread right here. So between 3 and 24% losses that we can have just in the surface. And that depends upon our storage type, and it also depends upon our practice and whether we use plastic or not. Then feed out losses, we can have anywhere from 15 to 40% losses, depending upon how good of a job we're doing there. And other factors that we talked about before with those moisture and density pack and all of that, that's going to impact our feed out losses as well. So there's a big spread on those last two, but those are the ones that we can have a lot of control over, and that's the good news. So factors that help us achieve an efficient fermentation. The first one is going to be optimal moisture. Besides the fact that we're wanting to harvest our crop at the correct maturity, we also want to harvest it at the right moisture. Because if we're too wet, we're not going to have an efficient fermentation. That's where we have some of those secondary fermentations that take place. If we harvest it too dry, 
we have a fluffy product that we're trying to pack the oxygen out of and we just can't get that job done. So optimal moisture is key. The second one is having plant sugars. So those lactic acid bacteria are gonna utilize plant sugars to convert to lactic acid and that's what drives pH down. We wanna have pH down because that's where we stop all that microbial growth. So we have to have plant sugars there and moisture in order for that to happen. So those are our two first ones. The next one is we have to have an anaerobic environment. We have to get the oxygen out of there. Those lactic acid bacteria can't do their job efficiently if there's oxygen present. And the, micro, the, the naughty bugs, the, the spoilage organisms, they like having oxygen there. So we're packing the oxygen out of there so that we can help aid in, in an efficient fermentation. And then the last one, yes, I work for an inoculant company, but even if I didn't work for an inoculant company, I'm a big believer in inoculant so that we can help drive that fermentation and overwhelm that process. Okay, so small grains, harvesting triticale, wheat, all that stuff that we've been talking about uh, today. If we're gonna harvest in the boot stage, or if we're gonna harvest, if we're after a protein crop, then we're gonna harvest at an immature state. I'm not gonna get into that too deeply because we've covered that quite a bit. If we're after more of an energy crop or tonnage, where we have um, drought situations or we're forage deficient, we might be after more tonnage and so we're gonna let it mature more. The difference between the two is gonna be how we're gonna harvest it. If we're gonna harvest it immature, we're gonna have to wilt it for a period of time so that we can get it to that optimal moisture. Whereas if we can let it mature out a little bit and let it grain out some, then we can maybe direct cut it and have less handling with, with wilting. Um, the optimal moisture that I have, that I have here, um, 38 to 42%, um, that's not the textbook, that's, that's my window. 42% is gonna be too dry for an area like California or Arizona because it's just too dry and too hot out there to even get anywhere close to 42%. But I say 38%, we heard that, it's, that most of the crops are being harvested too wet. I say 38% because if we set a goal of 38%, then we might hit some 35. But if we set a goal of 35, then we might hit some 30, 32. So that leaves us on the wet side. So I like to keep that window very, very narrow. And we can also target how we're, how we're harvesting that with how, how long we're gonna let it wilt, how far we're gonna let the swather get ahead of the chopper, all that stuff to get, get that window narrowed up. So just to, to hit that point about energy versus protein, so looking at the boot stage versus the dough stage, we saw earlier and then also on this slide, we can have our protein drop in half or more. So you guys are gonna make some decisions about what you're after, what goals you're after with that crop and, and when you're gonna harvest it. So how long do we wilt the crop for? That's the, that's the question. Um, rule of thumb, in the beginning when we first start harvest, especially if we're that immature stage, um, we might be waiting 24 hours. We might even be waiting 48 hours for that crop to wilt in order for it to get to the optimal dry matter. But as we progress and get farther into that growth stage and that crop is maturing a little bit, we might be chewing the paint off of the swather with the chopper because we're not gonna be able to get that chopper too far ahead of us. It just, that window closes very quickly. So my, my caution to you is one, of course, don't bring it in too wet. Take the time it takes so that it takes less time. Just wait and be patient. But the other one is don't let your swather get too far ahead of you. What I've seen happen time and time again we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. It's taken forever for it to get to that dry matter. So then we tell the swather to go ahead and cut another pivot, cut another field, and then the game changes, and then we're too dry. So then we can have another set of problems that I'll hit on here in a little bit. So again, that goal, well, I put 38 to 40 there. I narrowed the window even more because 42 is a little bit dry in some places. All right, so when we're drying the forage, we want to have a nice, wide, shallow uh, windrow for uniform drying. If we have a, a thick, clumpy, narrow windrow, then we end up having wet stuff on the inside and dry on the outside, and good luck finding a balance between the two. Sometimes that wet slug that's in the inside of those windrows can help you out a little bit, um, because if we are getting to where we have, we're too dry, we'd like to bring in some of that moisture to help us pack it and get it put, put away and ensiled. But in general, we wanna have as wide of a swath as we possibly can. So having those meetings with your, with your harvesting team and who you're working with and talking about some of these expectations and asking them questions about their practices and how they do those things is gonna help you all as producers and nutritionists to, to feed that feed better by, by having that plan and having that communication with your harvesting team. 
Another trick is gonna be cut height. Besides the fact that we're trying to avoid bringing in a bunch of dirt by chopping that silage really low or chopping that crop really low, if you have a little bit of stubble that your windrow's laying on, you have some airflow that's going on underneath the windrow versus having it really close to the ground. And your soil moisture, especially with our spring crop, is gonna have an influence on that as well. If we've got wet soil and we have that windrow laying right on that wet soil, it's gonna take longer for it to dry than if we have some stubble for it to lay on. Does that make sense? Okay. So soil contamination, especially in wilted forages, it comes from a number of different places, but it's problematic. First of all, um, ash and dirt and mineral, those kinds of minerals are not a nutrient for feeding cattle. So it doesn't work for us. It in inhibits in fermentation, um, it dilutes the energy value, and it causes a lot of problems, besides the fact that it carries some unsavory organisms with it. But when we're swathing, there's some equipment that we use that it's designed to pull that crop up, pull that forage up off of the ground, and then it slices it. Well, it's also pulling some dirt up with it, which you can kind of see behind that swather in that picture. So then we also might be handling it again. We might be tethering, we might be raking, we might be doing some other things where we're bringing some more soil contamination into that windrow. And then when we come through with the chopper, the pickup head has these metal tines that's scraping along the ground and is also pulling dirt up into that silage. So do you see where our wilted crops can have some significant soil contamination issues? And that's not even when we get it to the pile. When we get it over to the pile, sometimes our pack tractors, if, especially if we're putting our silage on dirt, some of our pack tractors can be dragging dirt up into it as well. We can have some pretty high ash. I have a, I have a dairy that I work with that their alfalfa pile this year they can't even do an NIR analysis on it at the lab because there's so much ash in it. They have to do wet cam on it because it's just too dirty. And that's problematic for the cattle. So now let's talk about sorghum for a little bit. There's a few different kinds of sorghum and silage that we'll put together. We've got head chop. Sometimes guys will do head chop where they just come through and they chop the head of that, that grain. I always suggest that they do so, like, like Matt was talking about earlier, catching it in the dough rather than once that berry starts to turn hard it's got a waxy coat on it too. It's just gonna slip through the kernel processor and it's gonna decorate the manure pile. So um, if you do head chop, you can do it less mature because the grain is actually what's driving plant dry down. So it's the green part of the plant that's bringing a lot of moisture. So if you're just really after that high, pro, your high, high energy product, you can come in and you can do head chop and you can be at the right maturity and you're not having to worry about your moisture quite as much because you've got that grain that's really your biggest, biggest proportion of dry. Um, we've got forage sorghum that we can harvest. I love that Matt was talking about swathing it and letting it wilt for a little bit. I've got a lot of guys that aren't gonna take the time to do that. They're gonna come in and they're gonna direct cut it. And in order to do that, in order to direct cut a forage sorghum, you have to wait until those berries are pretty mature so that you have the proper moisture within that crop. If you, if you direct cut that forage sorghum before those berries are mature, you're gonna be really wet, like 20% dry matter, 80% moisture and that's gonna be problematic for you. Same thing with high moisture Milo. Has anybody ever messed around with high moisture Milo? It happens where we have a lot of drought situations where we can't put together a corn crop and we'll try to mess around with some high moisture Milo. It can make really nice feed, but the challenge is getting that Milo berry harvested for you to make high moisture Milo out of it before it's too hard. Because once it gets too hard, no matter hammer mill, roller mill, whatever you're trying to do, you're gonna have you're gonna have product that decorates the manure pile. You're shaking your head, you've seen that before, right? Okay. So feeding sorghum silage, um, you wanna manage your dry matter and your maturity, like I just explained. Um, the energy is actually very comparable to corn. Um, sorghum is actually higher in protein and fat than corn, so it's a really good um, feedstuff that you can incorporate into your ration if that's what you need to do. Um, high moisture grain, maintaining the optimal moisture like I just talked about. Precautions with feeding sorghum silage, moisture when direct cut can cause secondary fermentations, which are unsavory and not good for anybody. Um, nitrates need to be managed and prussic acid. We've covered that quite a bit in previous talks. So now the good stuff, are you guys excited? This is the part that gets exciting. Okay, so out in the field, we are, we are harvesting all kinds of organisms. From one plant to the next, there's different populations of organisms that are out there. Some of them are good, some of them are beneficial, but some of them are naughty bugs that we're also harvesting at the same time, and they all come in at the same time. Well, all of the bugs, whether we're talking about good bugs or bad bugs, they're all after the goodies. They all want the chocolate chips out of our chocolate chip cookie. Have any of you guys ever gotten a chocolate chip cookie that didn't have very many chocolate chips on it? 
like grandma gave you a cookie out of the tail end of the batch, right? Well, it still went into the TMR, but it may not have had as much muscle maker in it that didn't have as many chocolate chips, which is what we're really looking for for that energy, right? So have you guys ever had a burnt chocolate chip cookie? Anybody like burnt chocolate chip cookies? I do. I like that caramelized sugar. And the same thing happens in the silage pile. We can burn our, we can burn our silage by having heat damage. Well, what happens is we bind up proteins. So now the nutritionist has to add some protein to that ration. So we don't want to throw too many burnt chocolate chip cookies into that silage pile either. All the bugs are after the chocolate chips. So here's what's happening in that fermentation process. Sugars are going down because lactic acid is using those sugars to produce lactic acid, and then we have a drop in pH. By achieving this right here, we keep chocolate chips on our cookie. So what happens after all this? We've got all of the we've got all of the silage put away. We've packed it as good as we can. We've managed our moisture as possible as, as much as we can. We've still got organisms in that pile. Some are beneficial, some are not. But what we do is we quickly drop the pH on those naughty bugs, those foliage organisms. We take the oxygen away from them and we put them down for a little nappy. They don't go away, they don't disappear, they don't die off, they just become inactive for a little while. So what happens when we open the silage back up to feed out to the cows? The disco ball comes out, the stereo gets turned up, and they're looking for chocolate chips, all right? So that's what happens, whether they're good bugs or bad bugs. They're all gonna wake up and they want the goodies. So the question is, how many naughty bugs do you wanna wake up when it's time to open up your silage pile? And that really has an impact with how efficient our fermentation was. So I'll just give you an easy anecdotal analogy here. Let's say that our fermentation takes 15 days and we put down 100,000 naughty bugs, that we're gonna wake up 100,000 naughty bugs when we open that up for, for, to, for feed out. Well, let's say that we don't get into that silage pile for 90 days, which is what I always teach people. Sorry, is that loud for everybody? Is anybody still sleeping? Um, I always try to coach guys to keep their silage inside for at least 90 days so that we've caught up to starch digestibility. That's a subject for another day. But let's say it takes 90 days before we get into that silage pile, and let's say it took 85 days for that, efficient, for that fermentation to take place. Well, now we're waking up a billion naughty bugs because as long as it took for that fermentation process to happen, those bugs just continued to multiply and reproduce. And so now we've got a lot more naughty bugs that we're waking up when it comes time to feed out silage. So now we have bunk instability issues, we've got heating, we hardly have any chocolate chips that we're gonna put in that nutrient into that TMR mixer. Does that make sense? So how many naughty bugs do you wanna wake up when it comes time to feed out your silage? Having an efficient fermentation is what dictates what that number is gonna be. So now let's talk about inoculant. I already told you that I believe in inoculant. Inoculant, I liken to storming the beaches of Normandy. Is there anybody in here that doesn't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about storming the beaches of Normandy? That's World War II stuff, right? How did we take the beach? We had a lot of soldiers that showed up without guns. Our airborne rangers jumped out of the airplanes and dropped their guns on the way down. So how did we take the beach? The Germans had some pretty big guns over there, right? We showed up with a ton of soldiers, a ton of soldiers. We just kept on hammering them, hammering them with soldiers. And that's what an inoculant product's doing for you. It's overwhelming the process. The inoculant doesn't care how many good bugs or bad bugs we have out there. It's gonna overwhelm that process and get it done quickly so that we put less bad bugs down for a nap that we're gonna have to deal with later when we're feeding silage. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, kernel processing. That's the next topic that we have on here. Kernel processing and chop length. They have to do with density pack. They have to do with getting oxygen out of the pile because when we have intact kernels or longer chop, we're gonna have a difficult time getting the oxygen packed out of there. And I have, see these cups that we have here? These are 32 ounce cups and you can, I just threw some corn samples in here to kind of give you an idea. This is actually scientifically related to good kernel processing and, and related to this 32 ounce measurement is related to what they're looking at in the lab for a kernel processing score. So you take a 32 ounce cup, you scoop up your silage, and you look at how many intact kernels that you have in this measurement of feed. So this is a picture right here that shows you a little bit about what optimal kernel processing looks like out of this 32 ounce cup. And then this is adequate to poor kernel processing. So here, is this my pointer? Okay, so here we've got 
This is not bad, but they're not shattered wide open. I maybe have a couple of kernels that are still intact. Over here, I've got a few more kernels that are still intact. These are gonna be pretty digested. These are gonna ding you on your kernel processing score because they're gonna sit on top of that screen. But you can see that the rumen organisms can probably get to the majority of that starch. But what do you see going on over here? We've got a whole lot of intact kernels over here. And here, we have some burnt chocolate chip cookies. I wasn't making this up. Okay, chop length. Do you think that this is gonna pack well? This is what it looked like coming in. Look at all these long pieces right here. This stuff's gonna get sorted out. It's not gonna help us from a nutrient perspective. It's just gonna, it's gonna be in the refusals. So that's tonnage that we're not gonna be feeding to our cows. That's part of our shrink and our nutrient loss, right? Um, but we're also gonna lose density pack on that. Here's the thing, we have varying situations that are happening out in the field. We've got varying moistures, we've got varying soil types, we've got problems that happen with equipment, sometimes the knives on the chopper have to be sharpened. There's different things that going on, go on. So my advice to you when it comes to kernel processing, dry matter, and chop length, is to have somebody at your operation that's continually monitoring these things throughout harvest. If you don't assign somebody to do it, and you just assume somebody is looking at it, you're gonna be sadly mistaken. So having somebody that is continually monitoring these things throughout harvest is gonna help you exponentially with multiple aspects of your feed recovery. Okay, density pack. I promised you guys I was gonna geek out on density pack. So here we go. All right, there's multiple factors that impact density pack. And density pack is where you guys can make it or break it on your silage, um, on your silage nutrient recovery. Higher density pack is gonna be better nutrient recovery, less density pack is gonna be poor nutrient recovery, plus some unsavory organisms that can cause some problems. So the biggest one that we can influence to some extent is gonna be the rate of delivery. So you see where I have this 800 rule up here? In parts of the country, the 800 rule applies. In other parts, it doesn't, and I'm gonna dig into that a little bit. What the 800 rule is, is you take your tonnage per hour and you multiply that by 800, and that tells you your pounds of heavy metal that you need to have on that pile to achieve optimal density pack, okay? That's what the 800 rule is. But I'm gonna to explain to you here in a second why that's not very applicable in some parts of the country. So if we have a situation where we have 120 ton per hour that's coming to the pile, I have two different scenarios depending upon what we're working with. So for an average of an 18 ton truckload, it, at 120 ton an hour, that's 6.6 .6 trucks per hour, that's a nine minute load for our pack operators to get put away. Not bad. What if we have a 25 ton truck? That's 4.8 trucks per hour, that's 12.5 minutes per load that our pack operators have to get it put away. Now using that 800 rule, 120 times 800, and I used a 50,000 pound tractor as an average, I think that's fair, some are heavier, some are not. That's 1.92 tractors that we need to have on that pile for a delivery rate of 120 ton per hour. You tracking me so far? Okay, now let's click it up a little bit. How about if we're clicking 480 ton an hour coming in, which is actually realistic. In the eastern part of the US where we have smaller operations, maybe not so much, but in the western US where we have massive silage piles that we're trying to achieve in a short period of time, we're clicking some ton per hour, y'all, okay? One chopper can do, one chopper, one efficient new chopper itself can do close to 480 ton an hour. So let's just say that we have two choppers that are clicking away pretty decent at 240, we have 480 ton an hour. At 18 ton trucks, we have 26 trucks per hour, that's 2.25 minutes per load for those pack tractors to put away. Now those guys aren't going 90 miles an hour, all right, because tractor speed to pack that silage is also a variable to helping us achieve density pack. So 2.25 minutes per, per load is not an awful lot. Now let's have a 25 ton load, 19 trucks an hour, three minutes per, per load to get put away. A little bit better than two and a quarter, all right? But here's our, the, this is where the 800 rule doesn't always apply. Tell me how many piles you have seen that we have room for 7.68 trucks. Is that gonna happen? Does your harvester even have 7.68 tractors to throw on that bad boy? Probably not. All right, so our rate of delivery, controlling our rate of delivery is an awesome concept, but when you guys have custom chopping operators out there, do those guys have time to slow down harvest? Do, can you hold up trucks? Do they have 
time to slow down their rate of delivery. You don't want your silage pile open that long. And I'm sorry to say, they got another job that they've got to get to. That's just reality. All right, so I don't know how we're going to control rate of delivery. Um, that's still a mystery to me. If you guys have an opportunity to slow up trucks, if you see that your pack tractors are getting buried, not a bad idea if you can. All right, so if they are getting buried, you do have one tool at your disposal, which is to elongate your fill ramp. So elongate your fill ramp and narrow up your slope because if they have a longer fill ramp that they can take a load and have more distance to spread that load out in a thin layer, then that's better than having a short steep where they're trying to take a big load. You ever seen their tires spin out on the bottom of the pile? Not a good idea. So having a nice narrow long slope for them to, to carry that load up there is one tool that you can use if your pack tractors are getting buried and your rate of delivery is really high. So layer thickness is what helps us achieve density pack. It's a huge one, and that's why I have a box around it, because if we get, well, I'm just going to tell you, this is really um, a teaser, but four to six inches, four to six inches is how we get optimal density pack. We're looking for 15 to 16 pounds per cubic foot on a dry matter basis. Four to six inches is where we achieve that. If we get up to eight inches, we've lost it. And when you're up on top of that, when you're riding in the cab of that pack tractor, it's really hard to tell whether the blade is four to six inches off. But here's what happens. I stand off on the side of the pile and I watch what's happening over there. That's how, that's how I pack a pile is from the side. I watch the blade and he's, he grabs the load and he's taken up there and he's got his four to six inches and he's cruising up the pile and then he's getting up to the crown of the pile and he goes, row, row, I've still got silage on my blade. And so he lifts his blade. So maybe, maybe that load dump gets driven over. It might get driven over with the next load that's coming over it, all right? So four to six inches is where it gets layered the whole way. So if they're taking a full blade load and they don't have, I know they have the horsepower to do it and they know they have the horsepower to do it, but if they take a full blade load and they don't have room to spread that load out in a nice four to six inch layer, then they're taking too big of a load. Maybe they take a half of a load. But if trucks are coming in hot, chances are pretty good they're gonna take a, a full blade load, they're gonna get to the top and they're gonna lift their blade. You're shaking your head like you've seen this happen before. Over and over and over and over. The good news is, is we have layer after layer after layer opportunities to get it right, okay? So here's the little teaser slide. This is just to prove the story that I just told you about 15 pounds. Here's our 15 pounds per cubic foot. Four inches, nailed it. Six inches, right there. Eight inches, out of the ballpark, right? Okay, four to six inch layers. This is what four to six inches looks like. This is about four inches right here. And it should be that thin the whole way. Okay, other factors that influence density pack, I'm not gonna dig into as deep. Did anybody hear me say four to six inches? Okay, tire width and tire pressure. Tire width, less density pack. Higher, higher tire pressure, better density pack. If we're farmers and we wanna have less compaction in the field, we let some air out of our tires. If we're on a pack tractor and we wanna get more density pack and better downward PSI, then we wanna put more air in our tires. So here's just a quick little schematic of that, of our wide versus our narrow. We have reduced surface compaction. This is where we're, this is zero to 12 inches. We have reduced surface compaction with this wide than we do with narrow. Okay, other factors. Dry matter and moisture. I've talked about that quite a bit. Particle size, we hit on that a little bit. Tractor speed, I talked about that a little bit. Slope and angle also makes a big difference. If we have too shallow of a pile, then we don't have any mass sitting on top of it on the sides, and so we don't have good density pack on the sides. If we have too steep of a pile, we might have some decent density pack because there's a mass on it, but the tractors aren't able to fully drive over everything, and a steep-sided pile is actually pretty unsafe. Okay. The pack tractors operate, the pack operator skill level is gonna make a big difference. How well are they gonna be able to handle the pressure of those trucks that are coming in hot? or the attitude problem that they're gonna get from some of those truck, driver, truck drivers after, you know, after all. They are truck drivers and we need them, but sometimes they give us some beef. Um, not real beef, like I'm talking that as, you know, no. Okay, so tractor operator makes a big difference on how we're gonna do with our packing as well. Load drops and turns. Historically, when we look at a silage pile, the top half of the silage pile is not packed as well as the bottom half of the silage pile. And this is where it comes from, is from those load dumps that I was talking about raising their blade. 
or maybe having too much on their blade when they turn at the top of the pile and then it slides off of the end. Even if their tractor blade has training wheels on the side of it to keep the silage contained, then that's where they lift the blade. So load, dump, load dumps and turns up at the top is where it happens. A picture tells a thousand words, right? So if you look here, this is the top half of the silage pile. Here's our sweet spot. This is packed really nice, got good density. This mass sitting on top of it is part of why they have good density. But those load dumps, that picture that I just showed you, that's how this gets missed, all right? And this was taken from Garden City a couple of years ago right after a rain. Here's our sweet spot. If we would have been nice and densely packed on the top half of that pile and on the sides next to the wall, we would not have this cold moisture migration that has taken place. The, the moisture was able to come down in and cool off the sides where we don't have density packed. Um, this is what a uniformly packed pile is gonna look like with an infrared camera. See how I just have a really thin layer here, but I'm pretty uniformly packed? It can be done. All right, so packing begins with the first load. Um, I've seen a lot of guys that come in and they unload their trucks um, the width that their pile is going to be. And then the pack tractor comes and smooths that hump out, and then he has a nice hump to start. Well, what he has is he has a nice little air pillow to start out the rest of his silage. I believe in starting your load, take your first couple of loads and spread that out the width of what your pile is going to be, and then start building on top of that in thin four to six inch layers. Right. Okay. So, a little trick. Um, let's say that we get into the weeds a little bit. Our swather gets a little bit too far away from our chopper and we've got dry silage coming in. Part of your small grain harvesting plan needs to include having some moisture to incorporate if something like that happens. So whether that's the inside of your windrow or whether that's a field that we can go direct cut because blending some wet with your dry better than a stick in the eye, right? So what happens is if you're too dry, you can't get those piles put away. You can have truck, you, you just can't get them put away. They're gonna blow away. You're gonna spend more time blowing off your radiator um, from the dry forage stuck to the radiator than you are getting density packed. So with our small grain silage, that's just something to consider. Don't be too wet, but don't be too dry. Another trick for you, don't get on top of yesterday's silage with your tractor. If you try to drive on yesterday's silage with your tractor, I don't know if you can see this dark point right here. Once that silage has cured overnight, it kind of softens. There's all this fascinating petri dish microbial activity going on in there. You have to put fresh soil, fresh silage on top of, of your cured silage in order to hold your tractor up. Don't, I've had some pack operators think that they need to rough up that surface a little bit to get good adhesion between new silage and old silage. All they're doing is causing you greater, greater spoilage. So make sure that they're putting new silage on top of old silage to hold the tractor up. Okay, poor density pack equals more air exposure, slowing the unsiling process and increasing yeast significantly. We have um, not a huge difference between the pH here, but we, you know, between a four point, what, 4.5 and, and five, but a significant difference in yeast, con in, in yeast count. So density pack has a big difference on that. All right, now these are the slides that I added. Um, just about storage types. And I'm just gonna throw this in here really quick because I know that there's a lot of question around what is the right storage type. So we've got ag bags. Ag bags are awesome if we have a, a slow rate of, of feed out. It helps us have a little bit of control there. It's awesome for dry matter recovery with keeping the oxygen out of the pile. You don't have that waiting period between when you're done putting the pile together and when you have plastic coming because I know everybody's gonna use plastic. So um, we've got the ag bags. Here's some, here's some advantages, some disadvantages. It's a high annual cost. It could be a high, um, it could be a potential um, initial cost if you have to do something to get the ground ready to put those bags on. But it also takes up a lot of landscape. So if you don't have endless amounts of real estate to put your silage up, then an ag bag might not work for you. But there are some significant advantages to it. Um, a bunker. A bunker gives you really good containment. It gives you good density pack. You've got great dry matter recovery if you've packed that bunker properly. But your bunker situation is going to have a significant upfront cost because you have to do the concrete floor and the concrete walls. Um, you could do dirt, but that's, that's going to take us in a different ballpark of what our quality is going to be. So if you're going to do a bunker, a concrete bottom and concrete sides that are lined with plastic and sealed up is going to be your best opportunity with bunkers. Um, high initial cost is a disadvantage. 
Um, sometimes you can bury older feed if you don't have that bunker cleaned out when you have time for new silage to come in there. I've got a guy in California that he's got silage that's had been buried four times because he just hasn't been able to get to it. So it kind of reduces your flexibility a little bit. Drive over piles take up a larger footprint. They have very little initial cost, kind of. If you're gonna put your pile on dirt, then you have pretty much no initial cost. But now we have an opportunity for dirt and problems to be in our silage pile. So is silage gonna cost a lot, you guys? Is it expensive? So let's consider putting our silage on a pad instead of dirt. And I know that that's an initial investment that we have to make. But again, this is a huge investment into the operation that you have every year. You can make your initial investment, have a nice concrete pad that you're gonna put your silage on, and then you have an opportunity, you have the flexibility of drive over piles with a lot better nutrient recovery than having to do wet chem on your silage because there's so much dirt in it, okay? Um, it's, uh, let's see. Minimal infrastructure that's involved. There are some disadvantages to having a drive over pile. Remember that first slide, those first slides that I was showing you about fermentation losses and that surface spoilage or surface losses is a big one. A drive over pile, you have the largest amount of surface area to be um, compromised. So a drive over pile can be a challenge. It, drive, it, takes, it takes a lot of management in getting it right. So the economics of your storage type can vary depending upon what your goals are, what kind of a storage solution you're gonna use, um, things to consider, investment in the site, including the development of the site, the cost of the structure, the cost of packing and bagging, the cost of covering, and then your dry matter and feed out losses. So cost per ton is gonna vary within these storage systems depending upon the assumptions and what your goals are. But um, like for example, a bunker infrastructure, without the bunker infrastructure, the cost of making a bunker um, infrastructure, your bags are gonna have the lowest cost. But if you incorporate the cost of building a bunker, then bags and bunkers might be about the same cost to be putting out. But these are initial costs. If we have this storage solution that's available over a long period of time, then the bunker's gonna pay for itself with the bags, you're just gonna have continual cost of plastic. And another problem with bags is, what do you do with the plastic after it's over? It can't be reused. So there's lots of things to consider here, and we can talk more about it. I'm about out of time, and I've saved myself four minutes for questions. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Okay, those are the things that we talked about. There's things that we have to do on purpose, you guys, in order for this to happen properly. Because Mother Nature's gonna throw us some curveballs. There's gonna be some things that come at us during harvest that we're not prepared for. But if we can make a plan and focus on these key points for silage quality, our moisture and harvest timing, having an efficient fermentation, monitor your top length, especially in your kernel processing, and then pack, 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 pack. Did anybody hear four to six inches? Okay, those are the things that I think that are important. Dun, 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 dun. All right, what okay. questions? Do you guys have any questions? Who wants to go first? You go first. Okay, so the question is what are the ideal, what is the ideal chop length for different forages? Um, at a feed lot, you're probably going to, going to want it to be a little bit longer um, so that because you're using it for some scratch, right? Um, so I would I would not like to go much over an, an inch, um, three quarters, three quarters to an inch. A lot of the current harvesting equipment caps out at 21 mil, so that's gonna be the longest that you can possibly get. Um, when you're at uh, an inch, your kernel processing can be compromised. So because there's just a lot more forage map that's coming through there. So five eighths, five eighths to an inch on any of them. Now, a question for the nutritionist that you might have, because it's easier to bring in effective fiber for scratch than it is to bring in density pack, if we get to where we're getting too dry, like 37% dry matter, for example, on corn silage, I like to shorten up that chop length a little bit. Your nutritionist might disagree with me, but like I said, we can't, we can't make up for density packs. So as we get drier, I believe in shortening, kernel pro or shortening chop length. So the comment is, it's worth it to invest in a pad. It'll pay for itself. It'll pay for itself. Don't be cheap on that end of things. Put a pad down. Anything else? Yeah, Becky, I get, we got a question here from Sioux County, Iowa. It says, what about using oats as a silage cover? 
Negative, Ghost Rider. Okay, the question is, what about using oats as a silage cover? Um, no, we're still gonna have oxygen penetration. Oxygen can penetrate as far as six feet into a surface depending upon how densely packed it is. So if you, and, and you, can have, you can have nutrient loss without seeing any spoilage. Besides the fact, what is that top, cr top crust layer gonna do when we mix it into the ration? Not only are we putting burnt chocolate chip cookies that have no chocolate chips in them into the TMR mixer, when we incorporate spoiled feed into the ration, we are dropping the digestibility and the dry matter intake of that ration. And we want them to eat, and we want what they're eating to work. So no on the oats. Anything else? Definitive on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we have time for one more question, if there's one more question. Um, liquid feed, I, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I have some feedlots that I've worked with that are, are spraying something on top of the silage pile. Um, I think there's a reason why we have a lot of research into plastic and oxygen barrier plastic. Um, I've had guys that have given me a hard time about using oxygen barrier plastic because of the investment and good Lord, nobody wants to cover that thing once, let alone twice, right? But they've complained about it the first time. And then after that, it's a no-brainer. So um, if I could see some solid data on what that returns on top spoilage, I think that'd be great. But I haven't ever found anything that was of value to do that. Again, that's your largest area of opportunity for loss, 4 to, what, 34% loss on that whole surface area right there. So protect the bottom and protect the top. OK. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks.